sermon which I am preaching this morning, in a sense, is not the usual uh, kind of sermon, but it is a sermon and an important subject nevertheless, because the issue that I will be discussing today is one of the most controversial issues confronting our nation. I'm using as a subject from which to preach why I am opposed to the war in Vietnam. Now, let me make it clear in the beginning that I see this war as an unjust, evil, and futile war. And I preach to you today on the war in Vietnam because my conscience leaves me with no other choice. The time has come for America to hear the truth about this tragic war. In international conflicts, the truth is hard to come by because most nations are deceived about themselves. Hard to come. Rationalizations and the incessant search for scapegoats are the psychological cataracts that blind us to our sins. But the day has passed for superficial patriotism. He who lives with untruth lives in spiritual slavery. Freedom is still the bonus we receive for knowing the truth. Ye shall know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. Now I've chosen to preach about the war in Vietnam today because I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. The truth of these words is beyond doubt, but the mission to which they call us is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, Men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty. But we must move on. Some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. And we must rejoice as well, for in all our history, there has never been such a monumental descent during a war by the American people. Polls reveal that almost 15 million Americans explicitly oppose the war in Vietnam. 
Additional millions cannot bring themselves around to support it. And even those millions who do support the war have fought it, confused and doubt-ridden. This reveals that millions have chosen to move beyond the prophesying of smooth patriotism to the high grounds of firm dissent based upon the mandates of conscience and the reading of history. Now, of course, one of the difficulties in speaking out today grows out of the fact there are those who are seeking to equate dissent with disloyalty. And it's a dark day in our nation when high-level authorities will seek to use every method to silence dissent. If something is happening and people are not going to be silent. The truth must be told, and I say that those who are seeking to make it appear that anyone who opposes the war in Vietnam is a fool or a traitor or an enemy of our soldiers is a person who has taken a stand against the best in our tradition. Yes, we must stand and we must speak. Over the past two years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences and to speak from the burnings of my own heart, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me about the wisdom of my path. At the heart of their concerns, this query has often loomed large and loud. Why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. And so this morning I speak to you on this issue because I am determined to take the gospel seriously. And I come this morning to my pulpit to make a passionate plea to my beloved nation. This sermon is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia. Nor is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the total situation and the need for a collective solution to the tragedy of Vietnam. Neither is it an attempt to make North Vietnam or the National Liberation Front paragons of virtue, nor to overlook the role they must play in a successful resolution of the problem. This morning, however, I wish not to speak with Hanoi and the National Liberation Front, but rather to my fellow Americans who bear the greatest responsibility in ending a conflict that has exacted a heavy price on both continents. Now, since I am a preacher by calling, I suppose it is not surprising that I have seven major reasons for bringing Vietnam into the field of my moral vision. There is at the outset a very obvious and almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle it seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, and new beginnings. 
Then came the build-up in Vietnam. And I watched the program broken as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. And you may not know it, my friends, but it is estimated that we spend $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier while we spend only $53 for each person classified as poor. And much of that $53 goes for salaries to people who are not poor. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and attack it as such. Perhaps a more tragic recognition of reality took place when it became clear to me that the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and die in extraordinarily high proportions relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Holland. So we have been repeatedly faced with the cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schoolroom. So we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. But we realize that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago or Atlanta. And I could not be silent in the face of such cruel manipulation of the poor. My third reason moves to an even, even deeper level of awareness, for it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they ask, and rightly so, what about Vietnam? They ask if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. And their questions hit home, and I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government, for the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I cannot be silent. There's been a lot of applauding over the last few years. They've applauded our total movement. They've applauded me. America and most of its newspapers applauded me in Montgomery. A 
And I stood before thousands of Negroes getting ready to riot when my home was bombed. And said, we can't do it this way. They applauded us in the sit-in movement. And we non-violently decided to sit in at lunch counters. They applauded us on the freedom rides when we accepted blows without retaliation. They praised us in Albany and Birmingham and Selma, Alabama. Oh, the press was so noble in its applause and so noble in its praise when I was saying, be nonviolent toward Bull Connor. When I was saying, be nonviolent toward Jim Clark. There's something strangely inconsistent about a nation and a press that will praise you when you say be nonviolent toward Jim Clark, but will curse and damn you when you say be nonviolent toward little brown Vietnamese children. There's something wrong with that press. as if the weight of such a commitment to the life and health of America were not enough, another burden of responsibility was placed upon me in 1964. And I cannot forget that the Nobel Peace Prize was not just something taking place, but it was a commission a commission to work harder than I had ever worked before for the brotherhood of man. And this is a calling that takes me beyond national allegiances, but even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. To me, the relationship of this ministry to the making of peace is so obvious and I sometimes marvel at those who ask me why I am speaking against the war. Could it be that they do not know that the good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for their children and ours, for black and white, for revolutionary and conservative? Have they forgotten that my ministry is in obedience to the one who loved his enemies so fully that he died for them? What then can I say to the Viet Cong or to Castro or to Mayo as a faithful minister to Jesus Christ? Can I threaten them with death? Or must I not share with them my life? And finally, I must be true to my conviction that I share with all men the calling to be a son of the living God. Beyond the calling of race, a nation, a creed, is this vocation of sonship and brotherhood. And because I believe that the Father is deeply concerned, especially for his suffering and helpless and outcast children, I come today to speak for them. And as I ponder the madness of Vietnam and such within myself for ways to understand and respond in compassion, my mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. I speak not now of the soldiers of each side, not of the military government in Saigon, but simply of the people who have been under the curse of war for almost three continuous decades now. I think of them, too, because it is clear to me that there will be no meaningful solution until some attempt is made to know these people and hear their broken cries. Now, let me tell you the truth about it. They must see Americans as strange liberators. Do you realize that the Vietnamese people proclaimed their own independence in 1945 after a combined French and Japanese occupation? And incidentally, this was before 
the Communist Revolution in China. They were led by Ho Chi Minh. And this is a little known fact. And these people declared themselves independent in 1945. They quoted our Declaration of Independence in their document of freedom. And yet our government refused to recognize them. President Truman said they were not ready for independence. So we fell victim as a nation at that time of the same deadly arrogance that has poisoned the international situation for all of these years. France then set out to reconquer its former colony. And they fought eight long, hard, brutal years trying to reconquer Vietnam. You know who helped France? It was the United States of America. It came to the point that we were meeting more than 80% of the war cost. And even when France started despairing of its reckless action, we did not. And in 1954, a conference was called at Geneva, and an agreement was reached because France had been defeated at Dien Bien Phu. But even after that, and even after the Geneva Accord, we did not stop. We must face the sad fact that our government sought In a real sense to sabotage the Geneva Accord. Well, after the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, the United States came and started supporting a man named D.M who turned out to be one of the most ruthless dictators in the history of the world. He set out to silence all opposition. People were brutally murdered merely because they raised their voices against the brutal policies of Diem. And the peasants watched and cringed as Diem ruthlessly rooted out all opposition. Peasants watched as all this was presided over by United States influence and then by increasing numbers of United States troops who came to help quell the insurgency that Diem's methods had aroused. When Diem was overthrown, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictatorship seemed to offer no real change especially in terms of their need for land and peace. And who are we supporting in Vietnam today? It's a man by the name of General Key, who fought with the French against his own people, and who said on one occasion that the greatest hero of his life is Hitler. This is who we are supporting in Vietnam today. Oh, our government and the press generally won't tell us these things, but God told me to tell you this morning. The truth must be told. The only change came from America as we increased our true commitments in support of governments which were singularly corrupt, inept, and without popular support. And all the while, the people read our leaflets and received regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs and consider us not their fellow Vietnamese, the real enemy. 
They move sadly and apathetically as we herd them off the land of their fathers into concentration camps where minimal social needs are rarely met. They know they must move or be destroyed by our bombs. So they go primarily women and children and the aged. They watch as we pause in their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas preparing to destroy the precious trees. They wander into the towns and see thousands of the children homeless without clothes, running in packs on the streets like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers, soliciting for their mothers. We have destroyed their two most cherished institutions, the family and the village. We have destroyed their land and their crops. We have cooperated in the crushing of the nation's only non-communist revolutionary political force, the United Buddhist Church. This is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolutions impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pleasures that comes from the immense profits of overseas investment. I'm convinced that if we are to get on the right side of the world revolution, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism militarism and economic exploitation are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon cause us to question the fairness and justice of many of our present policies. On the one hand, we are called to play the Good Samaritan on life's roadside, but that will be only an initial act one day we must come to see that the whole Jericho Road must be changed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth with righteous indignation. It will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West invest in huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the countries and say this is not just. It will look at our alliance with the landed gentry of Latin America and say this is not just. The Western arrogance of feeling that it has everything to teach others and nothing to learn from them is not just. A true revolution of values will lay hands on the world order and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes and with orphans and widows of injecting poisonous drugs of hate into the veins of peoples normally humane, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged, cannot be reconciled with wisdom, justice, and love. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Oh, my friends, if that is any one thing that we must see today, 
is that these are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression. And out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And they are saying unconsciously, as we say in one of our freedom songs, they ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. And it is a sad fact that because of comfort, complacency, a morbid fear of communism, our proneness to adjust to injustice, the Western nations that initiated so much of the revolutionary spirit of the modern world have now become the arch anti-revolutionaries. This has driven many to feel that only Marxism has a revolutionary spirit. Therefore, communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real and follow through on the revolutions that we initiated. And our only hope today lies in our ability to recapture the revolutionary spirit and go out into a sometimes hostile world declaring eternal hostility to poverty, racism, and militarism. With this powerful commitment, we shall boldly challenge the status quo. We shall boldly challenge unjust mores and thereby speed up the day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rough places shall be made plain and the crooked places straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. A genuine revolution of values means in the final analysis that our loyalties must become ecumenical rather than sectional. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole in order to preserve the best in their individual societies. This call for a worldwide fellowship that lifts the neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing, unconditional love for all men. This of misunderstood and misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed by the Nietzsche's of the world as a weak and cowardly force, has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of mankind. And when I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of John. Let us love one another, for God is love, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let me say finally that I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against this war, not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart, and above all with a passionate desire to see our beloved country stand as the moral example of the world. I speak out against this war because I am disappointed with America. And there can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. I am disappointed with our failure to deal positively and forthrightly with the triple evils of racism, 
economic exploitation and militarism. We are presently moving down a dead-end road that can lead to national disaster. America has strayed to the far country of racism and militarism. The home that all too many Americans left was solidly structured, idealistically. Its pillars were soundly grounded in the insights of our Judeo-Christian heritage. All men are made in the image of God. All men are brothers. All men are created equal. Every man is an heir to a legacy of dignity and worth. Every man has rights that are neither conferred by nor derived from the state. They are God-given. Out of one blood, God made all men to dwell upon the face of the earth. What a marvelous foundation for any home. What a glorious and healthy place to inhabit. But America strayed away, and this unnatural excursion has brought only confusion and bewilderment. It has left hearts aching with guilt and minds distorted with irrationality. It is time for all people of conscience to call upon America to come back home. Come home, America. Oh, my Kayam is right the moving finger rights and having writ moves on. I call on Washington today. I call on every man and woman of goodwill all over America today. I call on the young men of America who must make a choice today to take a stand on this issue. Tomorrow may be too late. The book may close. And don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your way, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. And I'll place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. Be still and know that I'm God. Now, it isn't easy to stand up for truth and for justice. Sometimes it means being frustrated when you tell the truth and take a stand. Sometimes it means that you will walk the streets with a burdened heart. Sometimes it means losing a job. It means being abused and scorned. It may mean having a seven or eight year old child asking your daddy why do you have to go to jail so much? I've long since learned that to be a follower of Jesus Christ means taking up the cross. And my Bible tells me that Good Friday comes before Easter. Before the crown we wear, there is the cross that we must bear. Let us bear it. Bear it for truth. Bear it for justice, and bear it for peace. Let us go out this morning with that determination. And I have not lost faith. I'm not in despair. Because I know that that is a moral order. I haven't lost faith. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. I can still sing, we shall overcome, because Carlisle was right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant was right. Truth pressed to earth will rise again. 
We shall overcome because James Russell Lowell was right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold sways the future. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. With this faith we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith we will be able to go out and transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith we will be able to speed up the day when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. With this faith we will be able to speed up the day when the lion and the lamb will lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid because the words of the Lord have spoken it. With this faith we will be able to speed up the day when all over the world we will be able to join hands. And sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last with this faith. We'll sing it as we are getting ready to sing it now. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations will not rise up against nations, neither shall they study war anymore. And I don't know about you. I ain't gonna study war. No more.